Hello, everybody. I'm Joe McGovern, awards reporter here at The Wrap, and we are very happy to have you for our 2023-2024 International Awards screening series of Sweet Dreams with the film's writer and director, Anna Sendayarevich. Now let's take a look at a trailer for Sweet Dreams. Ratun saja mereka. Ini kesempatan kita. Saya frame the tail. Frame the tail. Kalau ada yang bertanya di mana Mister, bilang saja dia sedang sakit. The city is on course situated. Nee, het is hier gewoon normaal. Normaal. Wij zijn hier niet gekomen om te overheersen. Overheersen is banaal. Selama aku masih hidup, aku yang putuskan apa yang aku lakukan dengan tubuhku. Siapa yang bicara soal tubuh? Die dingen gaan van vader op zoon. God heeft dat zo bedoeld. Ja, zo heeft God het godverdomme bedoeld. Bagaimana kalau semua orang melecehkan diri mereka sendiri? Dengan begitu, semua orang tak akan terlupa. We zijn nu niet veilig. Te veel onrust. Dat kan me niet schelen! It is my pleasure to welcome Enya Sendayarevich. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on the submission. And I know you're um, in Los Angeles. We had a screening just now. Uh, it must feel great having the film seen with an audience and, um, you know, getting it able to feel that reaction. How's that been? It's been really, really good. Yes. We had the screening just a few hours ago. And... Um, yeah, the, the reactions have been really, really positive, and it was really nice to to talk with the people uh, uh, after the film finished. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really happy to be here in LA to show the film for sure. Before we talk about the film itself, if you can just tell us about you, and uh, you know, four years ago you had "Take Me Somewhere Nice," um, your first your debut feature, uh, a contemporary story, but a pers very personal story actually, or you mean in some ways. Tell us about that that project and uh, your uh, your your career so far, and kind of maybe just set set the table for talking about Sweet Dreams um, with talking about your other film first. Take Me Somewhere Nice was indeed my debut feature film. Before that, I did uh, several short films, um, and uh, in Take Me Somewhere Nice, um, it's a film about. Um, Three characters actually, uh, a, a, a Bosnian Dutch girl who who goes back to her country of origin, um, and she makes a road trip with her cousin and his best friend. And um, in that film, I you know I dived into topics like migration, like uh, identity, um, uh, East West uh, power relations as well, and also just questions about what what Europe is. Um, so, um, yeah, after making that film, um, with which I had in a certain way, uh, also an autobiographical relation because it is set in Bosnia, uh, and that's where I am from, um, originally, uh, but I grew up in the Netherlands. Um, so after making that film, I felt kind of an, a desire to, to dive into that other part of me. Um, and um, to understand more about the country where I grew up in, which is the Netherlands. And um, that, was, that was kind of a starting point to dive into this uh, colonial history of, 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 of the Netherlands or of Western Europe, which was the starting point of, of making Sweet Dreams. Yeah. 
so it, it, you know another sort of collision of of two cultures. This is uh, as we can tell from the trailer. This is 1900 on a sugar plantation in Indonesia, which was a Dutch colony at that time. Was it the year and the location that sort of occurred to you first? Um, because the we'll talk about how contemporary in many ways the film is. But did you did you know um, you wanted to do a period film, but with something of a different angle? Well, I knew in advance. Okay, I'm going to dive into this uh, this this topic, colonialism, um, and um, but I didn't want to make a, a conventional period film. Um, so for me, it was very important to not look at history as, oh, that those are the black pages <laughs> and now we've turned the pages and now we live on a white page, uh, which I think sometimes, you know, we refer to history like that. But I wanted to steer away from that and I wanted to connect history more with the here and now, uh, for using like a very contemporary film language. Uh, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so it's not it's not a very conventional period film. Um, so I started with the topic and then, you know, from there I moved to uh, the exact uh, time when the uh, film takes place around 1900 uh, and uh, the story evolved from there. After the film was over, I began to think about certain literary influences. Um, I thought about uh, Howard's End actually was a was a top was a thought that I had at one point. I thought about the Russian writers like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, uh, Anna Karenina. Um, I thought even about something like something like Oscar Wilde. There's a, a lot of wit in this film, and there's a lot we don't expect sometimes from a period drama, if you will, to have this kind of sarcasm and this uh, satire in it. What was in your head in terms of the tone um, of the screenplay when you were working? I was searching for the tone for quite a while, and um, it was clear to me, um, I mean, part of making it, uh, steering away from this conventional, you know, period drama, uh, was uh, also trying to find a certain kind of humor <laughs> in, uh, you know, in, 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 within this, this, this world, um, which you maybe wouldn't expect. Uh, you know, uh, when you would hear about, uh, uh, you know, a film about this topic. Um, but um, I I am a big fan of uh, uh, literature or films that, that, that use a lot of dark humor. <laughs> it's something that I enjoy a lot. Um, and, um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I wanted to, to have that as part of the film. Um, also, because the film uh, deals with such a, you know, it, it deals with such a, uh, um, um, I mean, it deals with a sense of desperation because that's th that's that's what I felt while while making the film while, while researching for the film. I felt quite desperate in a way, and I thought that using a certain kind of desperate humor could could kind of you know. Um, dive into that feeling or translate that feeling of, of, of desperateness. And I definitely, you know, that kind of humor you can find in, in, in books by Dostoevsky for sure. <laughs> so, you know, the, the brothers Karamazov, that was a big inspiration. And you also have in that uh, book, you have like the death of the father figure of the patriarch, you know? And so that was little uh, wink to, 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 to that book, you know, in, 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 in Sweet Dreams, that's also what happens at the beginning of the film, that the patriarch dies uh, and everybody is left at, at their own devices. Um, but apart from that, I also did a lot of, uh, you know, um, research in colonial literature from the Netherlands, uh, from uh, writers uh, from those times, uh, between 1850 and 90, 1920, um, who were writing about their experiences there. Um, so th th that was also very, very inspirational to, to, to read about that. Yeah. I was hoping to have you talk to, um, I'd like to know more about your aesthetic, but just to begin by talking about your, um, your visual wit, 
uh, because I, I've heard, I, there's a quote of yours I wrote down. Um, you said, uh, in your opinion, when a film um, is too tasteful, it becomes just too much art. Like a, like a, it's like an art object instead of being something that we can relate to. Right away, we're smiling because when we first see Agatha, her eyes are closed, but she has eyes painted onto her eyelids. Um, in, a, in the first um, 15 minutes of the film, there's a shot that is where the camera is inside of a tiger's mouth looking out and you see the teeth um, as people are talking. Uh, this is this is this is very inventive, um, and I w- was hoping you could talk about trying to apply a certain wit um, and and creativity to to shots so that the audience 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 doesn't think that they're watching something that's so tasteful. Mm. Yes, when it comes to taste, I I, I feel that. Uh, um, you can alienate in a certain way the audience by uh, just presenting things that are beautiful, uh-huh. you know. And and I think uh, you know I, I I we really wanted to to uh, embrace, for example, the, the sweats and the pores and you know so things that are very uh, human like uh, uh, and um, and 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 just to 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 bring the whole atmosphere. Uh, closer and to, to you know to make it feel more like a fever dream uh, uh, um, and um, yeah so so, so that, that that was very important indeed and apart from that the visual humor um, also has to do for me with um, you know I, I, I love cinema that, that that surprises you you know I love to watch films that you know where I don't really have no idea where I'm gonna go next and not only in terms of story, but also in terms of shots. Uh, you know, I, I really love to watch films where every shot is is kind of a universe of its own and tells its own story. And and that's really what we what we were what we were going for while making this film with, you know, with the whole team. That was that was our goal to have every shot tell a story. Yeah, the film is broken into chapters, and we get little titled chapter headings. Some of them are very almost one word. I think one of them is called lies or deception. But then some of them, my favorite of them is it's a whole line of dialogue that has just been spoken, uh, having to do with a dilemma regarding one of the characters. Um, I I actually laughed when I saw that. I thought it was so, it was so clever. Uh, was that always in your mind? Because it, it does then start to feel almost like um, a a novel. The, the, the a novelistic touch that's being applied. Yes, definitely, definitely. I I think that, you know, a, a cinema is an art form that 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 borrows from many many other different art forms, and um, yeah, li- literature and and painting are 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 some of them, and I think very important, uh, you know, influences as well. Um, so, uh, with the chapters, I, I really wanted to make this connection with, with literature that cinema has. That was a bit of a, a wink to, to that. Yeah. yeah. Wanted to ask about, um, where, where you went to film this movie. Uh, it's extremely lush. I mean, you know, we get lost in the, in, in these forests, uh, of green leaves and trees and moss. Uh, so was it in Indonesia? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> yeah, we were planning to shoot in Indonesia, and we were actually ready to shoot in Indonesia. I did a lot of a lot of location scouting, um, but prior to that, I did also a lot of research. I traveled to Indonesia to write uh, many times, and uh, uh, traveled through the country with a guide. And um, <clears throat> but uh, so in the end, when we we had to, we did the casting and we found the locations. And then uh, uh, we were supposed to shoot the film, and one month before departure, uh, there was a big COVID outbreak uh, in Indonesia. And uh, unfortunately, it, you know, we we really couldn't uh, get into the country. And uh, we first we waited for a few months, but it seemed that uh, 
yeah, the, it, it, the situation got worse and worse. So at some point we were really had to think of alternatives. And luckily the film, you know, like we were talking about before, it's not a conventional period film. So it's not a film, that, you know, that needs to show a very specific city in a specific, you know, it's more, the film is more, you can see it more as some kind of allegory. You know, it's a bit more surreal. It's, it's a whole, it's a, it's a universe of its own. So that also gave us some freedom um, that um, it, indeed we didn't really need it to, to, to shoot in, 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 in Indonesia. But what we did need was a, a nature that would be very similar. Um, so, uh, yeah, there were a few options that we researched and then we ended up in, uh, on uh, Reunion Island, uh, which is a French island still, and that had like this very lush nature and but that also had still some colonial architecture still there, um, so that that became, uh, yeah, actually the perfect solution. And in, in a way, it's it's right in the middle. Uh, so we had the whole Dutch uh, crew and and cast members coming from the Netherlands, and then the Indonesian crew and cast members, and then yeah, we we met on the reunion islands. <laughs> um, speaking of the of that uh, was. Curious to ask about your cinematographer, Emo. Yeah, um, thanks. Your second, you worked on your first film uh, as well, and in both cases, you prefer this Academy ratio, which is not a total square, but it's um, it's a, it's more of a boxy image um, and a wide angle lens. You know, uh, if you could maybe explain for people who don't know what that means, what a wide angle lens is, and why why do you um, love shooting? movies that way yes yeah, so um it's um so in, with, with a wide angle lens you have um uh, you can see like a whole um uh, uh, the, the environment becomes a bit alienating in a way because it's 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 almost like it's 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 not a fish eye, <laughs> but you feel like the whole world is in a way a bit distorted, you know. Because we were looking for you know to to really make a world of its own, um, we found that this this wide angle lens um, gave us an opportunity to to have like this fever fever like uh, way of seeing the world. Um, where everything is a bit distorted and things are not, you know, like they should be in a way. And um, so we were looking for that kind of distortion in a way. And I think through the, the wide angle lens really made that um, possible. Um, and when we're talking about the aspect ratio, the four by three aspect ratio, uh, I worked with that before. Um, and I think it allows you in a certain way, I mean, I think portraits are really beautiful with a four by three because, you know, you're really focused on the face instead of, you know, this area. <laughs> but also in a weird way, it allows you to to create a certain kind of humor um, in a weird way. So, I mean, for example, when you have... Uh, we had in in the in the in the in the villa in the in the house we have like these really high ceilings, and then you know this four by three will give you the opportunity to have a character really small and like with a lot of head headspace, which would you know make them feel a bit lost. Um, but you can also cut off different body parts easier with the four by three, so it, th there's some there's a certain dryness in a way, to the. To you know, to that aspect ratio that we that we liked for this film. Um, so you know, that was a combination uh, reasons why why in the end we, we we decided to go for this aspect ratio. It's it's growing in popularity. I mean, a lot of filmmakers are really preferring it, and it is the kind of it's the origin of cinema. That is the aspect ratio that movies were and, for, and photography as well were, were first done in. Um, it's a, it's it's kind of thrilling how many of you are going back and uh, using it, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I'm aware that a lot of uh, filmmakers are using it at at this point. I wouldn't call it a movement, <laughs> but and, and I wouldn't, you know, I'm I'm not even sure if if I'm going to do it next time. I don't I don't necessarily think so. 
I, I mean, it, it wasn't, I, I, I used uh, this ratio in my previous film uh, and also in the short film before that, but still we had a lot of debates uh, before choosing this aspect ratio. It wasn't, it wasn't like a logical continuation. It was really uh, a lot of debates, you know, how to approach this, th this world that, that uh, and um, yeah. And who knows what will happen with the next film. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a, I think that the, what, what, is so beneficial about it is that when you have um, this uh, this surrounding that is very lush and beautiful um, in a widescreen format, there's a temptation of the audience to only see how postcard beautiful it is. But with the with the lens and with the um, academy ratio, we actually do are focusing more on um, the story you're telling, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I think so too. Yes, definitely. It's a uh, it's again also a way not to make it beautiful in the cliched kind of. <laughs> of course, which is which which is your goal. So I wanted to ask about a couple of the actors, okay. Renee, who we know, uh, some of us know from the work of Paul Verhoeven, and uh, she's just fantastic, and she's kind of the 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 lead character here. Um, was was she someone obviously you knew of her work was she someone you were thinking about during the writing process even um like imagining a, a, an actor who could who would take this on uh, the character of agatha who's the widow of the plantation owner i rarely imagine actors uh until now it has never happened uh in all honesty so i i really just try to you know i try to follow the you know the the characters and and throughout the writing process, the characters change a lot. So even if I would imagine somebody in the beginning, by the end of the writing process, it, it will be a completely different person. So no, during the writing, I, I really need to have that freedom that it can be anyone. For me, it's also important, very important to do castings uh, with actors because we were looking for also a certain kind of detached way of acting. And uh, so for me, it was also very important to, yeah, to test that, to, to try, to try with actors and see how these dialogues would work. Uh, so it wasn't, um, yeah, I, 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 I didn't choose in advance, like, okay, these are the actors and that's, go that's going to be it. It, it, it. We needed to, to really try. And uh, so when, when Renee came to the casting, you know, I was really immediately blown away <laughs> So that was that, that was the thing. I mean, she's such an incredible actress uh, who is very very technical. So she can bring up emotions like you know to hear and then take it back again and go. You know, she's very very precise in 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 how she deals with material. And so that was just astonishing to see somebody have so much control. Um, and uh, so it, it was very clear right away that, that, that she, she needed to be, <laughs> uh, Agatha. Yeah. I've seen her interviewed about the film. She's won a, a few of awards for the movie, um, already. And she said that when, when, when you're directing, you know, you'll do a, a few takes, um, but you'll have much different acting styles in one take and then in a different take. And then sometimes you'll say, just go wild with this moment other times completely sort of deadpan and quiet uh tell us about that style of of directing and how much it helps you then um later in the editing yes so i mean what what, what i found out through uh, working on the short films that i did that i made and also the first feature film is that for me uh i, I mean of course, we know this sentence, right? That the film is made three times. First, in the writing, shooting, and editing. But I, I really think that, you know, you shouldn't underestimate how much of a film is made during the editing. And um, even when you have it all planned out, <laughs> like like we did, and, you know, we had the shot list and, and everything, still, in the edit, there's so much that, you know, story-wise, you can just have a complete shift on topic that you're dealing with and everything and and so for me it was very clear during my earlier work that you need 
freedom in 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 the edit and a way to uh, to to acquire that freedom is to have the actors um act in different ways you know in 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 in, in a certain shot on a specific scene um so that you know um so that later on you can still choose to uh have a different interpretation and i think the reason is also because um how emotions work it's sometimes hard to predict uh in real life i mean uh, so um i find i find that uh, very interesting and i i you know i i'm trying to make a film where you are on the edge of your of your you know of your of your seat so sometimes um it's more interesting to have an emotion that you wouldn't expect and actually it makes more sense <laughs> than the one that you anticipated so th it's it's just a way to to give me more more freedom in the editing and to to come to a performance that I, that is actually more truthful and uh, even if it's uh, more unexpected um beforehand did you find in the editing room that that uh, that take of the reaction that we wouldn't expect was the one that you used uh, for the film uh, quite often? Well, so, sometimes, yes, sometimes. Especially in moments where you anticipate that a character is just going to have like a very, very emotional response or be like very... Um, violent or have a violent eruption and then to have that option where actually the character is <laughs> you know is is hardly you know reacting sometimes um yeah we did go for for, for for that option and sometimes it would make a character more intelligence for example or or even vice versa you know because the characters are a lot of times very childish in 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 my film and i found i i thought that I, I was looking for a certain kind of humor there, because uh, I do think it, just because you're an adult doesn't mean doesn't mean that you are mature, right? So, um, so I I I I wanted to to dive into kind of certain kind of childish way of doing things, and that and that's what we also then uh, had as an option during doing all these different kinds of takes, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that because the other there, there are amazing performances in this, and I don't want to um, only single a couple of them out. So if you wanted to mention the others, but I the other performance that I wanted to ask you about, um, and I didn't know his name, but it, it's a uh, Rio Haas, because you just mentioned about the, the 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 childlike quality of the of the acting. He's probably one of the most mature people in the film, who actually is a child, um, a very important character. Another character who is of two different worlds. Where did you find him, and what was it like uh, directing a child? You know, using these same sort of techniques that you're talking about in terms of telling the actor to really let themselves go and then restrain and all that. <laughs> well, um, we did a, a lot of castings, uh, and we were looking for boys that would be. Uh, Dutch, Dutch, Indonesian, uh, and so I, I think I saw a lot of yeah, almost <laughs> every Dutch in the, there's not that many <laughs> so uh, in in the Netherlands and also in, in in Indonesia and I was I was really 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 lucky to have found Rio, um, who is just a very very intelligent kid and very very responsive and just a very natural actor as well so um yeah he 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 is um his father is indonesian his mother is dutch and he grew up in uh, on bali um so and he's bilingual and he understands all the different codes from the different cultures so he really understood a lot of the things that the film is about um but at the same time you know, in the in the film, he is very uh, serious, you could say, and um, uh, I th I thought that would bring a certain depth to 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 his character, who is carrying you know these two worlds on his shoulder, 
but isn't really part of, of either one of them. He's really a, a character that is in between worlds, so to say. In the film, he's a very serious character, but uh, Rio as a person, he's very goofy and, you know, he's really like, so between the takes, he was just jumping and moving around and uh, uh, and then when, you know, when, when I said action, he would be completely focused and, and he, yeah, he did a great job. It's great. I mean, he, you know, he, there's a real big moment of decision that he um, is involved in at, at the very end of the film. Um, and so I wanted to finish up uh, with two other questions and sort of the the ending is um, very special because we don't, uh, it's almost all in silence, or, well, rather without any dialogue for a long stretch before the film ends. Um, but the, the last line of dialogue in the movie, or one of the very, very last, um, is a character says, this is what facing the future looks like. How important is that line in us understanding this project of yours? Um, you know, because we're not meant to have it be so locked into 1900. You know, it really, really is about the uh, hundred and so years that are going to follow as well. Um, so tell us about what you wanted to convey, I guess, with that line, but also with the ending itself, without maybe without giving too much of it away, but um, what you ultimately wanted to say. Well, I mean, I don't think it can be captured in a sentence now, you know, what I want to say, because that's so you need to watch the film to know what I, <laughs> what I want to show. Um, but for sure, that, that, that piece of dialogue is, is very important. Um, I mean, she's talking about progress there, right? She's talking about you have to... And it's it's a bit you know it's a bit ironic of course the way that she's talking about it because when she says that sentence they are looking in a broken mirror, uh, and um, but she's talking about how you have to get uh, you know rid of the things in the past that are not working and to face the future, and 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 that's a question mark you know in how far um, are we able to do that. Uh, can we really turn the page and and be on the blank sheets? And should we, you know, how to deal with, with with history? Those are questions that you know that I that I wanted to ask. Um, and um, you know, I I I I I love films that that ask questions and that not necessarily <laughs> try to answer all of them. But, uh, but it, it, yeah, it, those are the questions that I that I was asking myself while while making the film. Yeah. So also I'm curious if you can reveal uh, where the title comes from. The title uh, more has to do with, you know, also this, this question about who is asleep, who's awake, uh, is, is this a dream that we are in within the film or, or also maybe a certain kind of nightmare? Uh, um, because they are living in this kind of doll house, it's all very dreamy, right? It's a dreamlike state, um, and in the end of the film, without spoiling it, there's one person who's going to wake up. So it has a lot to do with, and, and there's a lot of scenes who are in bedrooms. There's a lot of uh, moments where characters are are sleeping or about to go to sleep, uh, and then there's characters who are dead. So, you know, the, the difference between sleeping and, and, and being mm. dead, uh, it's a motive, so to say. Yeah. And the, the sweet dreams, the film uh, takes place on a sugar uh, plantation. So, the, and sugar, without spoiling, <laughs> uh, has a big role uh, in different ways uh, in, in the film. Lastly, to ask about the selection, the, the Dutch selection for the Academy Awards. I was going over the list. There's about 89 movies that are um, being put forth by their countries. There aren't that many women filmmakers. There are a few, but there really aren't that many. Um, so just I was curious just to wonder about being this election, and this is my favorite type of selection because it, it is a uh, satiric, challenging, offbeat, idiosyncratic film. It's not... You know, there are, I think, too many like serious war movies sometimes 
Not that that's bad, but that's just, you know, in the selection. So just if you want to just comment on knowing that that's that your film's the one. Very, very happy about it. And, and uh, to be picked by, by my colleagues in the Netherlands, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great honor. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I feel that um, I, I worked with a really great group of people on this film and everybody poured so much love in it. <laughs> well, when we were shooting, we really had the feeling that we were doing something really special. Uh, so just to feel that the film is resonating uh, with, with a lot of people, it, it's just, it's, uh, you know, it's a great feeling. And uh, hopefully, you know, it's, it's, it's spread <laughs> even more. Um, and uh, being, I mean, I, 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 I haven't really looked into how many female filmmakers have been uh, selected um, as a, a entry for, for, for the Oscars, but I do feel when I look around me that I have a, a lot of friends, female filmmakers, and I yeah. do see a lot of female filmmakers around me in my generation. So I do feel that there's a you know there's a lot changing in the last in the last years, and I think that change is going to continue, or at least you know I will continue. <laughs> so <laughs> you won't get rid of me yet. <laughs> but yeah. I do want to wish you the best of luck. I'm I'm rooting for this one. Really, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us about the movie. Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. It was a pleasure. I want to also say thank you to everybody else for joining us today and be the first to know about upcoming RAP screenings and get access to exclusive content and premium events by becoming a RAP Pro member. And for all screening information, including past screenings you may have missed, please go to the rap.com events tab on the main page.